So anthropologists have not been doing their homework. There's a lacuna in the ethnographic record created by the last two decades of repatriated anthropology. We have largely exempted from serious ethnographic study the institutions and cultural contexts to which we have best access, even though these institutions are central to contemporary struggles over race, gender identity, class privilege, international migration, and neoliberalism. I'm referring, of course, to universities. If one looks, for example, at the last four years of the journal Anthropology and Education Quarterly, one finds that out of 109 articles, only four were focused on universities, and of these four, only two addressed US contexts. That's right, out of over 100 articles in the AAA journal devoted to the anthropology of education, only two discussed American universities. Despite the obstacles IRBs throw in front of ethnographies studying minors, anthropologists have shown a strong preference for studying high schools, middle schools, and elementary schools over the educational institutional sector in which they themselves work. It's as if there were a taboo, an avoidance relationship, obstructing us from systematically studying the institutions we inhabit. We're willing to be reflexive, but not this reflexive. <laughs> Maybe in keeping with Marilyn Strathern's observation that universities evoke, quote, the insights and frustrations of familiarity, we feel we could not make something this familiar strange, despite the fact that in Strathern's words, anyone interested in the future of anthropology as a discipline should be interested in the kind of institution which reproduces it. Or maybe we fear the blowback from deans and colleagues for making the family's business public. So my title for this talk, Homework, is chosen partly with an eye to this sense that the ethnography of the university is a project we might wish to put off, like my teenage son whose math problems he brings home in his backpack, only to leave them there until five minutes before bedtime. <laughs> but if there is such an aversion, it's not shared by all social scientists. Recent years have seen a plethora of interesting, well-researched books on universities by sociologists, for example. These books tend, unlike the few anthropological studies we have of universities, to take social class as a central theme. And I might add that there are numerous novels that conjure and dissect university life, especially faculty life. These works of fiction start with the well-known comic novels of David Lodge, but this ensemble also includes works by other novelists as well. Uh, my favorite is Skios, which is about an academic who has to deliver a distinguished keynote and disaster befalls him. <laughs> At this point, I should note the anthropologists have not completely avoided studying the university. And incidentally, I call it the university rather than the academy or campus because I want to emphasize that I'm talking about a materially grounded institutional life world, not an abstract ideal, and not just the student niche in this institutional life world. We do have at least five ethnographies of universities published in the last 30 years, as well as journal articles and passing discussions in books here and there. Karen Ho's Liquidated, for example, has a nice discussion of Princeton. But what I'm proposing is a more systematic and self-aware campaign to mobilize the unique methodological skills of our discipline to understand universities as core institutions of American society, where normative ideas are manufactured and where race, class, and gender privileges are maintained and contested, especially in the context of contemporary neoliberalism. After all, accounting for 2.6% of GDP and occupying a central place in the career dreams and anxieties of the American middle class, the higher education sector is hardly marginal to US life. Before sketching out what an anthropology of the university might look like, I want to briefly discuss five ethnographies that have already been written. All are interesting, original, and well-written, but taken as a collective oeuvre, they offer a distinctly circumscribed understanding of universities. Michael Moffat's Coming of Age in New Jersey, Peggy Sandy's Fraternity Gang Rape, and Educated in Romance by Dorothy Holland and Margaret Eisenhart were all published 30 years ago around the end of the Cold War. Moffat writes about Rutgers, where he was a professor. Holland and Eisenhart write about two universities in the American South, one largely white and the other historically black. Sande uses her own university, the University of Pennsylvania, as the basis for a broader argument about fraternity culture. All three focus on the cultural world of undergraduates, 
whom Moffat calls the ultimate unfathomable aliens, and in particular on their social life. They skew heavily toward issues of romance and sexuality, on which Moffat, interested in what he calls the new sexual orthodoxy, that places sexual coupling near the center of undergraduate life, provides considerable lurid detail. Moffat also, playing up anthropology's traditional expertise on initiation rituals, tells us a lot about ceremonial practices in the dorms and fraternities, such as the sexualized secret center and wedgie patrol rituals. I leave it to your imagination what they involve. <laughs> Holland and Eisenhardt, writing from a feminist perspective, ask why female undergraduates don't live up to their full academic potential, finding the answer in a peer culture that defines success in terms of women's attractiveness to men more than academic or professional achievement. The authors find that many female undergraduates spend a disproportionate amount of time primping and looking for men, then catering to their needs once they've found them, and that their success in this endeavor regulates implicit hierarchies among women on campus. Sande, probing the darkest, darkest corner of undergraduate sexual practices, uses a fraternity gang rape at the University of Pennsylvania as the basis for an extended argument about ways men can displace their aggression toward one another, replacing it with homosexual bonding in an act of gang rape. Party sex is the glue that bonds the brothers to the fraternity body, she says, in a book that enlists the tropes of social science in an extended polemic against fraternities. I note that no anthropology journal reviewed Sande's book, though there was a perceptive review of it by Michael Kimmel in the American Journal of Sociology. Two more ethnographies are Susan Bloom's My Word and My Freshman Year by, quote, Rebecca Nathan, the latter being a pseudonym we now know, adopted by Kathy Small, who at the age of 52 posed as a mature freshman and moved into a dorm where she kept notes on the behavior of students, many of whom were unaware that she was writing a book about them. More than the two earlier ethnographies, the books by Bloom and Small focus on the time pressures faced by students juggling too many commitments. Calling her experience as a freshman transformative, Small says, quote, I found that the uncoordinated demands of my five courses at a big university were often overwhelming. I was pressed to the edge of my organizational abilities as I attempted to get in the three papers all due in the same week, or to get to a professor's office hours that were all scheduled when I had classes. Bloom finds that such time pressures, together with immersion in digital culture, which leaves students, quote, swimming in a sea of texts, can lead students to engage in what she calls patch writing, what professors see as plagiarism, but students are more likely to see as a kind of legitimate bricolage. As interesting as these texts are, and I recommend them to faculty interested in the lives behind the sea of undergraduate faces in their lecture halls, it's worth reflecting on what they leave out. Faculty, administrators, presidents, trustees, admissions officers, librarians, alumni, fundraisers, the content of the curriculum, the social organization of research, the content of research, financial aid, janitors and food preparers. Um, research about campus custodians is virtually non-existent, say Peter Magolda and Lillian Delman in the only anthropological article I've been able to find on this topic. Race and class. There's no entry for class Oh, sorry, there's no entry for race in Kathy Small's book index. And while there are three entries for class attendance, there are none for class. <laughs> the discipline that once aspired to produce holistic accounts of the entire life ways of the peoples it studied has somehow produced a collective account of university life that leaves out at least 80% of what is there, more or less reducing university culture to undergraduate culture. Okay, the next section is called the Cold War and the University. If we want a model for a reinvigorated anthropology of the university, we might start by looking at the literature on the Cold War in the university that's been produced by historians, STS scholars, and the occasional anthropologist. This literature says almost nothing about undergraduate life during the Cold War, but it has some very interesting things to say about the political economy of the university in those years. Its starting point, unlike the ethnographic literature, is money and funding. Its contributors point out that as the Cold War took shape, entrepreneurial university administrators like Vannevar Bush or Charles Draper at MIT leveraged the role science had played in World War II to persuade the US government to establish the National Science Foundation, 
or to get the Department of Defense to fund research, some of it classified, on, uh, at universities. For certain universities, particularly MIT, Johns Hopkins, and Stanford, the result was transformative. Suddenly awash in unprecedented amounts of research money, they were able to rapidly expand their science and engineering departments and to hopscotch their way up the league table uh, of universities. Meanwhile, on a more modest scale, foundations such as the Ford Foundation and the Asia Foundation did for the social sciences what NSF and the Department of Defense were doing for the hard sciences, provide funding to mobilize the university's apparatus of knowledge making on behalf of the Cold War struggle. By the early 1960s, the overhead revenue from defense contracts covered half the operating costs at the six leading US universities. This influx of national security funding produced not only a qualitative expansion of the university system, but a qualitative reorientation of knowledge making across a range of academic disciplines. It's important to emphasize that much of the research funded by the national security state was basic unclassified research, not direct applied military research. And this partly explains why universities, broadly liberal institutions, felt comfortable partnering with the government. Nevertheless, responding to the magnetic pull of funding from the national security state, discipline after discipline shifted its priorities. Physics shifted away from speculative theoretical concerns in favor of more practically useful experimental approaches. These were boom years for fields such as solid state physics and nuclear physics that were of interest to the military. Cybernetics and artificial intelligence, both useful in weapons guidance, also experienced the meteoric rise. Area study centers like Harvard's Russian Research Center flourished, and the social sciences be began to reorient themselves to thinking in terms of geographical areas studied by interdisciplinary teams. The social sciences also rebalanced around what I have elsewhere called Pentagon epistemology, favoring epistemological approaches such as behaviorism in psychology, rational choice theory, and Walt Rostow's developmental stages in economics, so-called realism in international relations theory, opinion polling and communications, and structural functionalism in anthropology and socio sociology. These were all approaches that emphasized the measurability, predictability, or controllability of human behavior. Meanwhile, new kinds of cleavages appeared within departments, especially science departments, between those with clearances and access to military funding and those without. funding recalls the emergence of two classes of university faculty, those who had grants and those who did not. Among those who didn't, there was some resentment of the grantees who seemed to have entered on a new academic lavish lifestyle out of keeping with the traditional university. These are his words. It was in fact the beginning of a shift in allegiance of scientists from exclusively the university to mostly the scientific discipline and the scientific panels in Washington. And needless to say, those with grants found it much easier than their unfunded colleagues to attract, fund, and train graduate students, thus skewing the university system further in the direction of the defense science paradigm. But the divergence between the two classes of earth scientists was pernicious in ways that went beyond funding inequalities, at times corroding the university's mission to produce objective knowledge. For example, Siva reports that the Navy wanted to classify, to make secret, the maps of the New England seamounts discovered by university scientists during the Cold War. They wanted to deny this knowledge to Soviet submariners. Faced with resistance from US oceanographers, the Navy agreed to publish the maps if the seamounts were incorrectly plotted. <laughs> in other words, the Navy insisted that scientific disinformation be published in scientific journals with the correct information known only to those with clearances. Siva speculates that the Soviets had done their own underwater mapping anyway. So, quote, probably the only sufferers were scientists who were not in the word of mouth network and privy to this falsification. Meanwhile, in the high years of McCarthyism, some left-wing academics were denied promotions and pay raises or drummed out of the American Academy altogether. And those that were not learned to keep their heads down. The human wreckage of McCarthyism lay scattered across the disciplines from Frank Oppenheimer, uh, J. Robert Oppenheimer's brother, uh, a Manhattan Project physicist forced to work as a cattle rancher in the 1950s because of his communist leanings, to Moses Finley, a brilliant classicist uh, fired by Rutgers after he was summoned by the House Un-American Activities Committee to which he refused to name names. <laughs> 
David Price and Laura Nader. That's Laura Nader when she was a bit younger. <laughs> David Price and Laura Nader have written about this dark period in American history in regard to the history of anthropology. Price catalogues the cases of left-wing anthropologists on FBI watch lists, like Jean Weltfish, uh, who was fired by Columbia University after 16 years of teaching there, then blacklisted, or Kathleen Goff, who moved to Canada rather than face the prospect of blacklisting in the US. She moved with her husband, David Abilly, who was in the same situation. As Laura Nader argues in an article on what she calls the phantom factor in anthropology, on the gravitational pull of an absence, this purging and blacklisting also had a chastening effect on the anthropologists who were not directly victimized, encouraging a culture of false patriotism and conformity, a society where independence of thought and action are frowned upon, her words, where certain questions were no longer asked. These diverse effects of the Cold War on the university system are pulled together by Rebecca Lowen in an exemplary study of a single university, this university. Stanford. Lowen highlights in particular the role of Frederick Terman. Uh, you may have seen buildings named after him on campus. Uh, who was Dean of Engineering at Stanford from 1945 to 55, then Provost from 1955 to 1965. Terman trained in electrical engineering at MIT by Vannevar Bush, was determined to use defense money to transform Stanford from a medi mediocre university for California's elite looked down on by East Coast Ivies into a top-ranked research powerhouse. In order to achieve this goal, he punished departments that did not bring in large grants, and he suppressed faculty opposition by appointing department chairs aligned with his ambitions, sometimes trampling faculty governance in the process. He consistently maneuvered departments into realigning their priorities to match those of the national security state. In Stanford's biology department, for example, the vibrant emerging field of ecology was purged in favor of biochemistry and biomedicine. In Stanford's political science department, traditional strengths in political theory and ethics were winnowed down in favor of apolitical expertise and the quantitative approaches favored by the military. And Terman made sure that tenure was denied to Mulford Q. Sibley, a distinguished political theorist who critiqued behavioralism and the nuclear arms race with equal passion. He also used government funding to establish the Stanford Linear Accelerator and to grow the Stanford Research Institute, which did a lot of applied military research. Meanwhile, by transforming Stanford into an institution designed to capture federal funding, he marginalized Stanford's traditional mission of undergraduate teaching. Rebecca Lowen argues in her concluding chapter that this marginalization of undergraduates contributed to the student protests of the 1960s. These protests for civil rights against the war in Vietnam and against the bland atmosphere of cultural conformity that was strangling intellectual life in universities around the country, were, as a widespread form of resistance, also an essential feature of the Cold War University. The next section is called the Neoliberal University. So after this detour through Cold War history, what can we now say about a potential critical anthropology of the neoliberal university in our own era? What questions would it ask? What hidden secrets might it seek to reveal, to expose? What experiences would it seek to textually animate? I would propose that a critical anthropology of the neoliberal university should focus on the reshaping of knowledge production and consumption in response to larger political economic forces, the transfer of contemporary corporate workplace practices to the university, the changing structure of the university workforce in the context of a broader economy marked by increased economic stratification and labor casualization, the use of universities as mechanisms of capital accumulation by elites, the role of universities as part of the machinery of intergenerational socioeconomic stratification in an increasingly unequal society, and the silent complicity of liberal faculty with all of this. Let's unpack this. <laughs> or I could just end there. <laughs> <laughs> as with the literature on the Cold War University, a good place to begin is with funding and defunding. The overarching story here is one of divergence between the elite private universities and the rest, especially public universities, and the increasing precarity of the public university. In the last 25 years, the elite private universities have continued to capture the lion's share of private and federal research dollars 
got donors to pay for buzzworthy buildings. This is the Stata Center at MIT, where my son was in daycare at one point. And they've multiplied their endowments. So this shows you the uh, top Ivy League endowments and their returns. And you see how they out outperform even the best public universities. The 40 wealthiest universities get 60% of all the gifts given to American universities. And the top 10 private universities capture about $6.4 billion in federal grants and contracts every year. Stanford gets about $68,000 in federal grants and contracts per enrolled student. One wag joked that Harvard, whose endowment at over $37 billion is greater than the GDP of many countries in the global south, is not so much a university as an investment fund with a university attached. <laughs> Meanwhile, state universities have much smaller endowments. At my last university, George Mason, $73 million. And a study by the American Academy of Arts and Sciences reports that public funding for the top public universities, the so-called public ivies, fell by almost 30% between 2008 and 2013. And while public universities struggled to persuade state legislatures to keep subsidizing the state educational sector, private universities receive hidden government subsidies by virtue of their tax-exempt status. Nexus estimates that these subsidies amount to around $41,000 per student at the wealthiest private universities, and an astonishing $105,000 per student at Princeton. Compare that to the $12,500 per student the state of New Jersey gives for Rutgers, or $2,400 per student for Essex Community College, both near Princeton. In this situation, public universities have struggled to stay true to their traditional mission, which is, in the words of Christopher Newfield, to combine nearly universal access with the highest quality in teaching and research. Maybe one day we will have a rich, nuanced account of these struggles by a university president, someone like Nick Dirks, the anthropologist who is chancellor of UC Berkeley, who we can hope has been taking good notes on his travails. <laughs> we can be sure that these funding cuts have unleashed conflicts behind closed doors more than in public between state governors, legislators, university presidents, provosts, trustees, admissions officers, and others. It would be good to have an account from a skilled participant observer of the structure of these conflicts and the cultural logic of the remedies that ensued. As this chart shows, public universities have made up some of their funding shortfall with steep tuition increases in very recent years. And they've sought to cut their academic labor costs by replacing tenured and tenure track faculty with adjuncts where possible. But they've also experimented with other remedies less visible to the public eye, but with deep implications for the traditional mission of public universities and the character of student life. One remedy is to try to recruit more international students since they pay full unsubsidized tuition rates, unlike in-state students. Often, as a George Mason, this involves turning to international recruiters who are paid a bounty for each student recruited and who therefore have an incentive to exaggerate the ability of their recruits to meet US academic standards. 37% of US universities now use such foreign recruitment agents. At Western Kentucky University, for example, recruiters receive $2,000 for each student they recruited from India. But over a third were thrown out of the university at the end of the first semester for failing to meet basic academic standards. Beyond this, many public universities have broken with their traditional mission of providing a quality education at a reasonable cost to students from their own states and have instead sought to become national universities attracting wealthier students from the rest of the country who will pay out-of-state tuition rates that may be three times as high as in-state tuition rates. In 2000, over 80% of students at public universities were from in-state. Now, it's less than a half. University presidents and regents have found that it's much easier politically to raise revenue this way than to increase in-state tuition still further, even if one consequence is that fewer in-state students get to attend their own state's leading public universities. Thus, a recent report by the California State Auditor found that over a decade out-of-state enrollment at the University of California's flagship campuses had increased by 82%, and that the university had turned away 4,300 in-state students whose test scores were as good as 
or better than the median test scores of the admitted applicants from out of state. Writing about this trend, the New York Times concluded that, quote, one result is the creeping privatization of elite public universities that have historically provided an accessible route to jobs in academia, business, and government. One of the most important paths to upward mobility, open on a meritocratic basis to people from all economic classes, is narrowing. According to sociologists Laura Hamilton and Elizabeth Armstrong, another consequence is that in order to attract affluent students from out of state seeking a memorable college experience, many state universities below the public ivies, think Arizona State, with apologies to anyone from Arizona State here, these universities have relaxed academic standards, built lavish athletic and recreational facilities, invested in high-profile sports teams, turned a blind eye to fraternity excesses, and silently condoned a student culture of hedonist superficiality and nonstop weekend drinking, at least for the coveted students who pay top dollar. This means that the titillating culture of sexual hedonism that so fascinated Michael Moffat in Coming of Age in New Jersey, a culture we now know to be deeply entwined with practices of sexual assault and not just in fraternities, this culture of sexual hedonism must be understood not simply as something that just is, a form of analysis that naturalizes it, but as the product of partly concealed neoliberal processes that are transforming many state universities from meritocratically organized institutions that facilitated social mobility for middle and working class kids of nearby families into institutions slanted toward the predilections of wealthier non-local students. It also means that the campus culture of indulgence, often criticized by conservative Pecksniffian moralists like George Will, is in complicated ways a product of the economic order that such conservatives defend. This culture of student indulgence, at least among some undergraduates, or as George Mason calls them, customers, <laughs> this culture of student indulgence is located within a university whose workforce is increasingly subjected to neoliberal forms of discipline and extraction of surplus value, characteristic of the wider political economy. As Henry Giroux and Eric Gould have argued, the last 25 years have seen the increasing corporatization of university governments and management. One component of what Chris Shaw and Susan Wright call the new managerialism in universities is the rise of what they describe as, quote, coercive techniques of accountability transferred to higher education from the financial sector through what they call simulated disciplines of the free market. It is no coincidence that our best analysis of such techniques comes from two British academics, since Margaret Thatcher, as with so much else when it comes to neoliberalism, pioneered the imposition of such practices on academia. Explicating these practices through a Foucauldian lens, Shaw and Wright say this, a key aspect of this process has been its effect in changing the identity of individuals and the way they conceptualize themselves. The audited subject is recast as a depersonalized unit of economic resource whose productivity and performance must constantly be measured and enhanced. To be effective, audit technologies must somehow refashion the way people perceive themselves in relation to their work, to one another and to themselves. In short, they are used to transform professional, collegial, and personal identities. This practice often goes under the name of empowerment. However, what the language of efficiency, effectiveness, best practice, self-management, self-enhancement, and value for money disguises is that audit culture relies upon hierarchical relationships and coercive practices. We need more anthropological studies of what Marilyn Strathern calls <coughs> audit cultures, which are to our era what time and motion studies were to the Fordist era. Catherine Besterman and I are near the end of a project in which together with other anthropologists, we examine the dynamics of what we call robo-processes, algorithmic, algorithmic scripts at the conjuncture of digital technology and routinized social interactions. Standardized tests and mortgage assessment <laughs> protocols are examples. Many of these robo-processes incorporate routines for auditing human performance. In the course of our project, one of the things that struck Catherine and I about audit processes in the educational context is the ways in which they incite practices commonly recognized as deformative uh, to game the measuring protocols in the system, often presumably with consequences that the architects of the system would find undesirable. Sometimes this takes the form of outright lying to auditors, 
which the admissions dean of my own university was found guilty of, just making up numbers. But even without, without outright dishonesty, when functioning normally, the system incites cunningly compliant behavior that undermines its avowed purpose. Seeking to incentivize more and better faculty publications, the metrics instead create an epidemic of salami publishing. Seeking to promote competition among schools for the best students, the metrics instead produce outcomes like the one found in a Russell Sage study of law schools, where admissions deans, afraid of trustees looking over their shoulders at the league tables, turned down smart, interesting students who did not test well in favor of a literal, literalist emphasis on LSAT scores. Or there is the infamous instance where the new president of Mount St. Mary's College introduced an algorithm to identify students most likely to drop out, students, incidentally, who came disproportionately from less elite families. The idea was that the college could preemptively remove them before their failure affected the public ranking of the college. The president, and that really is him, <laughs> the president, a former private equity fund manager chosen by the trustees to bring business practices to the college, told a group of appalled faculty, quote, this is hard for you because you think of the students as cuddly bunnies, but you can't. You just have to drown the bunnies. Put a Glock to their heads. <laughs> I've got a reference. <laughs> Metrics are now a standard part of faculty evaluation, and there are proposals to deepen their bite for everything from pay raises to job termination. For example, the Iowa legislature discussed a bill that would publicly identify the five professors at each state university with the lowest stu uh, student evaluations, then allow students to vote on whether or not to fire them, regardless <laughs> of whether they have tenure. <laughs> Survivor, here we come. <laughs> This intensified measurement, and I'm glad you're laughing. Because <laughs> otherwise you'd have to cry. This intensified measurement and surveillance of academic productivity and conformity, best understood through Foucault, coexists with a sustained attack by university managers on tenure and on faculty salaries, best understood through Marx and his theories of extracted labor value. The big story here, of course, and one that comfortably tenured faculty like myself might prefer not to notice, is the rise of adjunct faculty relative to tenured and tenure track faculty. In the words of Jagna Schaaf and Joanna Lessinger, in this book, and I have to say something about this, this is an AES monograph. Almost no one buys AES monographs, <laughs> but it's a beautiful book. There's some great essays in there. So in the words of Schaaf and Lessinger, themselves adjunct faculty in anthropology, the part-timer is, in administrative eyes, the most desirable employee. Cheap, powerless, quickly hired, and quickly fired. Where adjuncts used to be a relatively small and transient part of the academic workforce, filling in for faculty on leave while they themselves worked their way toward a tenure track position, the number of adjuncts has quadrupled to over one million between 1975 and 2011. And concentrated in lower tier universities, they now represent over 50% of the academic workforce. 61% of them are women, and according to a 2014 congressional report, their median salary is, I was going to have you guess this, but you wouldn't guess this low. Their median salary is $2,700 per course. That can work out with grading and class preparation time to as little as $9 an hour. Many of them are called freeway flyers, lacking office space and constantly driving between different institutions where they teach single classes. The same congressional study found that 25% of adjuncts are on public assistance, meaning that many universities have the same employment strategy as Walmart, which is notorious for paying its employees so little that they also need Medicaid. As Schaaf and Lessinger put it, quote, if we look behind the emic curtain of status and professionalism, in other words, if we bracket for a moment the fact that these are among the best educated people in the country, and instead consider non-tenured rank in terms of real wages, income, and job security, it closely resembles the wage earned by undocumented immigrant workers. In fact, reading the first person testimony of some adjunct faculty, I found myself reminded of interviews I read a decade ago with underpaid janitors 
who said they appreciated working at Harvard because the food the students threw away was indispensable in feeding their families. Based on their own interviews with other adjuncts, Scharf and Lessinger report that aside from the insecurity and low wages, adjuncts suffer from what one of their interviews described as isolation, feelings of hopelessness, feelings of worthlessness, being treated like shit. In a recent much cited piece in the Chronicle of Higher Education, Kevin Birmingham, an adjunct professor of English at Harvard, currently described the adjunct situation as, sorry, correctly described the adjunct situation as the great shame of our profession. He points out that, quote, unlike the typical labor surplus created by demographic shifts or technological changes, the humanities almost unilaterally controls its own labor market. New faculty come from a pool of candidates that the academy itself creates. He adds, one might think that the years-long plunge in employment would compel doctoral programs to reduce their numbers of candidates, but the opposite is happening. From the Great Recession to 2014, U.S. universities awarded 10% more English PhDs. And these are the numbers from anthropology. Then he asks, quote, so why do we invite young scholars to spend an average of nearly 10 years grading papers, teaching classes, writing dissertations, and training for jobs that don't actually exist? His answer, English departments do this because graduate students are the most important element of the academy's polarized labor market. They confer departmental prestige. They justify the continuation of tenure lines. And they guarantee a labor surplus that provides the cheap, flexible labor that universities want. Birmingham concludes his piece by saying, we tell our students to study literature because it will make them better human beings. That in our classrooms, they will learn empathy and wisdom, thoughtfulness and understanding. And yet, the institutions supporting literary criticism are callous and morally incoherent. Those of us who are faculty like to concentrate on the satisfactions of what used to be called the life of the mind, our research into things we care about that we alone will bring to the notice of the world. The cuddly bunny student in our class who we've turned on to critiques of racism, sexism, and capitalism. The exciting conversation about critiques of neoliberalism with a newly befriended colleague that stretches on late into the night at the spring conference of the American Ethnological Society. <laughs> this feels like good progressive work to be doing in the midst of a society where so many people are cogs in other people's money-making machines. But our life of the mind has a material basis, which for all our talk about reflexivity, excites too little curiosity from us. Whether we pay attention or not, it is grounded in and paid for by institutions that handle substantial sums of money and play a vital role in mediating the class structure of late capitalism. Over the years, as we've been talking about critical theory and necropolitics, almost without noticing the institutions in which those conversations take place have become more and more exploitative of those at the bottom of its socioeconomic hierarchies. As colleagues and administrators, often well-meaning liberal people, have made a series of small decisions to triage declining resources. Universities have become places that try to block the formation of graduate student unions and replace janitors with benefits with cheaper, less secure contract workers while paying Walmart wages to people with PhDs. My own university, led by a president who was an English professor, just joined the Chamber of Commerce in lobbying the Washington DC City Council to deny a living wage in Washington DC. But there is a still deeper and less visible way in which universities have become complicit with the new neoliberal order. This concerns universities' role as mediators of social mobility and capital accumulation in the American class system. I'm interested here in two mechanisms, admissions, especially to elite universities, and debt. If we start with admissions, it's no secret that a university degree is a capital asset in terms of lifetime earnings prospects, and that admission to an elite university is the jackpot in this lottery. But here, universities have become part of an apparatus that is sedimenting inequality and making social mobility harder. Universities lean heavily in admissions decisions on standardized tests, despite compelling evidence that these tests are biased against racial minorities and those from lower socioeconomic groups, and despite the role of the test preparation industrial complex in grooming affluent students for these putatively objective testing exercises. In 1970, the bottom two family quartiles in American society accounted for 28% of BAs in the US. By 2014, that percentage had declined 5% to 23%. A recent Washington Post article reported 
that at the top five Ivy League universities, quote, there are more students from families in the top 1% in income than from the bottom 60%. What's more, about 25% of the richest students attend a selective elite college. By comparison, less than one half of 1% of children from the bottom 20% of US families attend an elite college. And some of those who do struggle. The New York Times reports that one in five university students goes hungry at some point in every month. And then there's the issue of debt, which David Graeber has reminded us is one of the most powerful mechanisms for social control in capitalist society. As state universities have compensated for lost state subsidies by raising tuition, it has become harder for families of limited means to pay for the university education that in a knowledge economy is the best hope for escaping the low wage, low security economy of the service sector and the declining industrial workplace. In this situation, some families may liquidate savings painfully accumulated through a life of labor, diverting money into 529 accounts, out of retirement accounts, or taking out loans against the equity they've built up in their homes. Through a process of surplus extraction, masked and mystified by the nonprofit status of universities, these hard-earned savings of working people get diverted to banks that service the loans and to the new managerial class on campus that earns corporate salaries. And students themselves take out loans, lots of loans. So you see here that student loan debt exceeds credit card debt. This shows how steeply it's increased in recent years. There is now $1.3 trillion in outstanding student debt, more than Americans collectively owe on their credit cards. And unlike other kinds of debt, it cannot be expunged by bankruptcy. This debt is regressively distributed. And in the context of stagnant wages, it is a drag on college graduates' capital accumulation. That is, assuming that students graduate. But over a half do not graduate, if we include statistics from the new for-profit universities, such as the University of Phoenix and Kaplan University, which have been accused of using deceptive, high-pressure sales techniques to persuade students to take out loans for unrealistic courses of study. Those who drop out find themselves in the worst of all possible worlds, saddled with a debt that makes college possible, but without the boosted earnings its graduates anticipate. Minorities are particularly hard hit here. The National Center for Education Statistics reports that minority students have twice the dropout rate of white students. And as a recent Washington Post article put it, with minimal savings and other assets to cover college expenses, African-American families borrow heavily to pay for college, placing greater strain on already tenuous wealth. For minority students who borrow then drop out, instead of being a ladder to increased earnings and status, the university system becomes a trap door through which they fall to a life of increased debt without increased earnings. Their ambitions for self-betterment used against them as a means of keeping them down. Those of us who are faculty are, unwillingly to be sure, a part of this apparatus. If we are older, we started teaching at a moment when tuition rates at public universities were manageable and student debt was more proportionate to the leverage it enabled. But in academia's own version of the story told by Naomi Klein in The Shock Doctrine, legislators, lobbyists, bankers, trustees, and administrators have rewired the complex financial circuitry behind the wall panels of the university. And we have become cogs in a wider machinery of financial extraction, stratification, and immobility, quite unlike the Cold War University, which, for all its faults, was a much friendlier university for the middle class and for those aspiring to be middle class. OK, so you'll be relieved to hear I'm coming to the end. And what sort of knowledge has the neoliberal university been producing? Just as funding from the national security state reshaped research programs and teaching curricula during the Cold War, so university curricula and research programs today are being remolded in response to an economic environment where Defense Department program officers now jostle for influence with billionaire bankers, IT magnates, biotech entrepreneurs, and other wealthy benefactors. Integral to this environment is the new ideology of conservatism, where conservatives in the culture wars of the 1980s used to rally behind such figures as Alan Bloom and preach on the indispensability of the great books of Western civilization. Now many conservatives have turned against the humanities, 
and have become enamored of STEM, business, economics, and engineering. Florida Governor Rick, uh, Rick Scott. I couldn't resist. There were lots of pictures I couldn't resist. Florida Governor Rick Scott, for example, wants to discourage students from studying the humanities by charging them more to study the humanities than something useful. The second and third tier universities have been most flexible in responding to these stimuli from politicians, national security bureaucrats, and donors. Some have responded to the flood of post 9-11 defense funding with hastily confected master's programs of dubious rigor, often with an online component in homeland security or cybersecurity. Arizona State University, Northeastern University, Towson University, Monmouth University, Virginia Commonwealth University, the University of Maryland and George Mason University, are all examples of this stampede to capture Homeland Security funding, either through new research centers or through tuition dollars from those seeking jobs in the expanding national security bureaucracy. Others have signed agreements with conservative donors that give these donors leverage over hiring and curriculum. For example, BB&T Bank gave over $60 million in grants to mostly public universities in the Southeast for what they called moral foundations classes. Some of these grants taken by universities such as Clemson and Florida State specified that Ayn Rand had to be on the curriculum, that speakers series should be oriented toward the work of Ayn Rand, and that chairs should be awarded to faculty sympathetic to Ayn Rand. <laughs> the Koch brothers have signed similar agreements, especially with George Mason University, which alone has taken over $87 million from the Koch brothers for centers that churn out a massive free market gray literature. But in terms of what we might call the corrosive shaping of knowledge, there is a deeper scandal than these scattered instances of deans and presidents compromising their institution's academic integrity for spare change from billionaires and bankers. It's a scandal that's so big, it's hard to see. It concerns the wholesale failure of certain fields that proclaim themselves objective to create accurate knowledge and to cultivate the kind of diversity of thought or critical reflexivity essential to collective intellectual growth. With apologies to anyone from these fields who might be present, I'm thinking here in particular of economics and international relations, fields heavily tied to capital and to the state. <coughs> American international relations scholars, regularly called on for advice by the government, utterly failed to foresee or to theorize the possibility of the most important event in a generation in its era, area of expertise, the end of the Cold War. Not that this has stopped governments from continuing to consult them. As for economics, I'm fascinated by the ways in which economic students who are otherwise deferential in my introductory anthropology class feel free, tell, I'm sorry, feel, feel free to tell me that I am wrong when I say that capitalism produces inequality, or that shareholder value is at odds with the interests of workers, or when I explain the labor theory of value. How have these freshmen and sophomores already learned from their economics professors the confidence to tell a professor in another field that he's wrong about economics? And why do they feel so protective of neoliberalism? I would love to see a critical ethnography of economics, like the critical ethnographies we already have of some other fields, immunology by Emily Martin, Psychiatry by Tanya Luhrmann, Robotics by Sherry Turkle, and Evolutionary Simulations by Stefan Helmerich. A critical ethnography of economics would examine the boundaries of what can and cannot be discussed, the ways in which neoliberalism is normalized, the practices through which hiring decisions are made, and norms for pecuniary relationships between economists and financial institutions. And it would address this issue. We now know that the global financial regime in the early years of this century was building a bubble that endangered the stability of the entire global capitalist system. And yet the major economics departments in the United States were, with the exception of a few discounted Cassandras, entirely blind to the imminent catastrophe. A catastrophe that economics majors at George Mason, by the way, told me was caused by an excess of government regulation. <laughs> They'd been reading Anne Rand. <coughs> the economic crash of 2008 was not just a failure of the banking system. It was a failure of the university system that was entrusted with producing the knowledge and training the experts required to maintain the stability and growth of a complex global economy. We spent billions of dollars building a system of knowledge that utterly failed us. It turned out to be a sort of economics Maginot line. 
How were the anointed experts on the economy so unable to see the pathology overtaking the system on which they were experts? Part of the answer to this question presumably lies in a kind of intellectual conformity. But it also bears noting that many of these economists were caught in a web of relationship with powerful economic institutions that exerted their own pull. Many economists consulting for the very banks whose good health they proclaimed had serious conflicts of interest, though they may not have seen them as conflicts of interest since the American Economics Association did not have a code of ethics until 2012, in itself an astonishing fact. My one paragraph conclusion. Anthropologists are interested in race, class, neoliberalism, identity, social justice. I've tried to suggest that we don't have to go far to investigate these issues, because unless we're practicing anthropologists, we work in institutions, universities, that are in a way I find profoundly painful, deeply involved in the reproduction and extension of neoliberalism. This is not to take away from the importance and the beauty of the work we do expanding a humane understanding of the other, and awakening the love of knowledge and critique in students. But that powerful and empowering work takes place in a material context that is disempowering for many in ways we need to attend to both in our research and as citizens who, as Margaret Mead famously said, always have the power to change the world. Thank you very much. <laughs>